new month, so let's have all the J July birthdays and anniversaries. Please stand. July birthdays and anniversaries.
that that play over and over and over in my heart all week. Amen. Let's say no last verse.
effects from medications for patients and you need to cheer and like continue further.
find the text this morning, Romans chapter number 6. Book of Romans chapter number 6. <coughs> Romans chapter number 6, we'll begin reading in verse number 1. If you would, stand for the reading. If you're able, whenever you find it. Romans chapter 6 and verse number 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Let me just stop right here and make this statement. I don't need a few amens. God doesn't need us to be worse just so He can be better. Uh, grace is not a license to sin. Uh, our, our, our evil and unrighteousness is not what makes him look better. God is just better. That's just all there is to it. He's just good. And uh, in verse number 2, God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore, we are buried with Him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we, should, uh, we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of His death, we shall also be, in, uh, be also in the likeness of His resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, thank God. Amen. That the body of sin might be destroyed, hallelujah. That henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is free from sin. Thank God I'm free. Amen. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, died no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. You can be seated this morning. Over the years in ministry, I've had countless kids come to me and say, I want to get baptized. Boy, I mean, that's exciting. Uh, that will send a preacher into panic mode. Nobody move. Uh, but the reality of it is, my usual response is, is let's talk about that. We've even known, seen some adults come out of the blue and say, I want to get baptized. Can I tell you this morning, before we, the church, before we can baptize anybody, before we can baptize anybody, we have to make sure they understand what it means. And what it does. Listen, and what it does not do. We need to know what the motive is. Why is it that you want to get baptized? I can't think of a better passage in all of the Bible to take just a few minutes this morning and teach a little bit on scriptural baptism than Romans chapter number 6. Before we can get to baptism, though, we need to talk, in the notes, we need to talk, number one, about the reality of salvation. 
When the Apostle Paul wrote this to the Romans, listen to me now, he never set out to preach or to present the erroneous doctrine of baptismal regeneration. Paul was never pointing someone to the water baptistry. He was never pointing someone to the lake or the river or the baptistry in the church, which I don't think they had one back then. <coughs> Trying to tell them that that's how they got to say, listen to me this morning, friends. If you've been taught, if you've been taught that there's any saving power in the baptismal waters, you've been taught heresy. The Apostle Paul puts before us the power of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ as concerning our salvation. Remember, he's already wrote to us in Romans chapter number 1. It is the gospel that is the power of God unto salvation. Paul paints a picture before us that Jesus died to pay for our sin, that He was buried and that He rose again so that we could have eternal life. Paul is telling us in all of this that what Jesus did for us is what happens to us in Him when we put our faith and trust in Jesus. You hear me this morning? Let me see if I can't make this a little clearer. Water baptism has nothing to do with your salvation. And let me say it like this. When I ask you, tell me about when you got saved. Listen, friend, I'm not asking you when you got baptized. Right. Yeah, but preacher, the book of Acts, Paul was told to arise and be baptized to wash all his sins away. That's what the baptismal regeneration people preach. I hope you understand. I hope I can make it clear this morning if God will help me that Paul's baptism as yours is was for the benefit of his public. The, Paul, the, the, the people that were around Paul that knew Paul they needed, they needed to see that Paul was a changed man. He had been a persecutor of the church. He had been an enemy of God. They needed to see that he was changed. They needed to see that he was not the same person anymore. And we're going to talk about the public nature of baptism in just a minute. But make no mistake about it. When Paul got baptized, he was already saved. When Paul gave his testimony about being saved, he didn't talk too much about when he got baptized, but he talked a whole lot about that Damascus road. Can I tell you that Paul's sins had already been washed away in the blood of Jesus. When he was to be baptized, that was for the benefit of everybody that could see it on the outside. That's what your baptism was. Salvation should always come before baptism. That's what Paul preached. Acts 16, when the Philippian jailer asked him, Sir, what must I do to be saved? And he said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And then he got baptized. That's what Philip preached to the Ethiopian in Acts chapter 8. The Ethiopian, this is a redneck version, not the King James, but the Ethiopian asked Philip, said, hey, I want to get baptized. Philip said, first of all, you're going to have to believe. You're going to have to put your faith and trust in Jesus as your Savior and be saved. If you're not, listen to me, friend, if you're not saved this morning, 
If you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, if you need to be saved, if you're on your way to an eternity separated from God, we don't need to fill the baptistry for you. We need you to get saved. You need to know about what Jesus did for you that He died and was buried and rose again to make it possible for God to save your wicked soul. And then you need to make a decision, a conscious decision, whether or not you're going to trust that for your salvation. I want to know first and foremost this morning, are you saved? Salvation is the dying, as verse 6 puts it, of the old man. Something happened when I got saved. God could not accept the old me that was lost in sin. God could not accept the old me that didn't have the blood of Jesus applied to my life. But when I put my faith and trust in Jesus, it killed the old man. Preacher, what happened to the old you that was lost? The old lost you, what happened to that? He died December 11th, 1984 when I got saved. The old me was separated from God. The old me was a stranger and an enemy to God. The old me, if, if, if he would have died, would have split hell wide open. I don't know about you, but I'm glad the old one's dead. I didn't have much use for the old one. The old one wasn't doing me any good. Thank God that one's dead. Thank God when he, uh, that, that the old man, as the song says, is dead. That's what happens when you get saved. Salvation is also the burial of sin. Verse number 6. Knowing this, that the old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed. The burial of my sin. God took all my sin, past, present, and future, and buried it with Christ. Did you know that burial, that's the final part of a funeral. We have all of the procession, we have all of the service, we have the, the cemetery, and there, there's usually more preaching out at the cemetery because the preacher thought of two or three more points on the way out there. But when the dirt spilled back in over that casket, that's a stamp, that's the finality. They're not coming back. That's when reality sets in. They're gone on this side of heaven. Did you know that's what God does to our sins? He took my sins, hey, and they're gone. Not coming back. They're gone. Thank God my sins are gone. They've been buried. Salvation is the resurrection to new life in verse number 4. Therefore we are buried with Him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. A new joy. A new purpose. A new understanding of the things of God. Did you know when He gets, when he gets saved, you get the Holy Spirit. He teaches us all things, the Bible says. New desires. Oh yes, getting saved is a change. Just like the physical resurrection of the body in the rapture that's described in 1 Corinthians 15 when Paul said, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Just like that physical change that Brother Don's talking about a while ago in the resurrection morning when all the dead in Christ shall rise, I'll have a new body, praise the Lord. And just like that physical change, there's a spiritual change that takes place when you get saved. 
raised to newness of life. And salvation is the hope of heaven. Verse number 8. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with Him. I got a lot of stuff I can complain about on this side of heaven. A lot of aches and pains coming on. I heard all over worse than anywhere else. But at the end of the day, I know where I'm going when this life's over. How do you know, preacher, because I'm saved? Preacher, I, I want to get baptized. Well, we'll get to that. But first of all, let's talk about salvation. I remember several years ago, there was a lady visitor, never seen her before, never seen her since, that came during the invitation and she told me, I want to get baptized. And I said, well, first of all, let's talk about your salvation. She said, I don't want to talk about my salvation. I just want to get baptized. I don't want to talk about being saved. I just want to get baptized. I'm tell you something, folks. We could, we didn't, and we wouldn't, but we could have baptized her a hundred times, and she'd still be lost because she never got saved. <coughs> Before we can even talk about baptism, we've got to talk about the reality of salvation. That water back there won't do anything for you. Won't do anything for you as far as your eternity in heaven. But then number two, we get to the next point, the representation of baptism, water baptism. Scriptural baptism, not the most important thing. The most important thing is for you to be saved. But that being said, scriptural baptism is important. God expects it for every single person that's been born again. Every single person that's been saved, God expects you to be scripturally baptized. Scripturally baptized. Y'all hear that? <laughs> Baptism is a public or outward identification. Not an identification with a certain social circle. Sometimes young kids, especially the younger they are, it seems like the more this happens, but young kids will want to be baptized, hey, because their friend did. Uh, because their older siblings did. Hey, I don't want to be left out. That's why we have to sit down and talk and make sure that they understand what all of this is about. Now, I was a different kind of kid when, my, when I got saved and then baptized. I was thought on a different level. I've always been kind of weird. Some kids want to get saved because all of their friends did. I wanted her to baptize. I mean, I wanted to be saved, but I was not too excited about being baptized. For one thing, I could not figure out how I was going to get in that water without having to stick my head under there, and I didn't know how to swim. Scared of the water. Another thing, I couldn't figure out how I was going to get baptized and still hide behind my mama's skirt tail the whole time. But some kids, some people want to get baptized because their friends do. It's not an identification with your certain group of friends. But baptism is an identification with the Lord. With your Savior. Listen to me now. Let me say it like this. If none, if none of your friends ever got baptized, God would still expect you to if you're saved. It's an identification with the Lord and it's an identification with the Lord's church. 
Listen to me now. If you're going to identify as a Baptist, you need to be Baptist baptized. There's two good reasons to get baptized if you're saved. Number one, it is the command of God. We do it out of obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ. That ought to be enough. Just because He said so? Because He said so, we do it in obedience to Christ. And then number two, the second reason for being baptized is because scriptural baptism is the door to the church. It's how you become a member of the Lord's church. You were either, if you're a member of this church, you were either baptized here or the church accepted your baptism from another Baptist church. Either way, you were added to the church by baptism. Scriptural baptism. You can read Acts chapter number 2 for yourself and you can find, you can see that the Lord added unto them daily as many as gladly received their word. They got saved and were baptized and added to the church. <clears throat> Baptism is always done under the authority of the church. Amen. This whole idea, this whole business, this whole doctrine of Baptist baptism that I preach on so hard from this pulpit. Listen, friend, I didn't make this stuff up. That's what our church has historically practiced. That's how Baptists got their name in the first place. It wasn't because of some, hey, I think this is a good name. We'll call ourselves the Baptist. No, they got that name because people coming from the Catholic Church and other places and they came and wanted to join up with the Baptists and the Baptists said you're going to have to have Baptist baptism. So they rebaptized. That's how we got our name. It's the door to the church. It's the church that has the authority to baptize. Preacher don't have any authority in and of himself to baptize anybody. You as a church member don't have any authority in and of yourself to baptize anybody. The church does that. Baptism is an outward declaration that you by faith in Christ have died as a lost sinner that your sins have been buried, that you have been born again and raised to newness of life in Christ Jesus. Let me ask you a couple of good questions. How good have your sins been buried? Well, if you're saved this morning and good enough that they're not coming back, Good enough that you'll never need to be saved again. Somebody say amen. amen. I mean, they've been buried good. Well, let me ask you something. <coughs> Talking about baptism. What is the better representation of that burial and that death? You want God to sprinkle a little dirt on top of your sin? Or do you want it buried? It's the proper method or mode of baptism immersion I mean that's the picture our sins have been buried it's gone all the way under gone all the way under here's another question how immediate was your new birth in Jesus Christ when we baptize somebody we put them under and then immediately bring them back up again. Obviously, you can't hold them under too long. I mean, there's been a few I thought about holding under a little longer. But the picture is an immediate death and resurrection. That's the picture that baptism presents. Now, aren't you thankful this morning for God's immediate 
salvation. Thank God when He saved me, it was not a progressive salvation. I'm not looking for a second work of grace. I'm not waiting to see if it worked out. I'm not seeing, waiting to see if it's going to take. But the instant that you believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior, it's done. You're saved forever. Preacher, I want to get baptized. <coughs> First of all, let's talk about your salvation. Are you saved? Have you trusted Christ to save you, a sinner? And if you have, now are you ready to identify publicly with Christ? By the way, that's a deal breaker in a lot of the mission fields and a lot of anti-Christian countries. Muslim countries, pagan countries. It's a, it's a deal breaker because they do not want to be identified with Christ publicly. And then, are you ready to become a member of the Lord's church? You get baptized here, they're going to call you a Baptist. Are you prepared for that? Because there's a lot of people in our society who can't seem to abide that, can't tolerate that. They're going to call you a Baptist if you get baptized in the Lord's church. Amen. The representation of baptism. And then number three in this text, there is the reckoning of the newness of life. Verse 11 Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin. The reckoning. I looked up this word reckon. It's the same Greek word that was used back in chapter 4 and verse 8 that we looked at last week. It's the same word that's translated over there as impute. Reckon or impute. It means to count. It means to reason. It means to take an inventory. So what we need to do today, we need to take some inventory. In verse number 11, if you've made the decision, if you have made the conscious decision to turn from your sin and trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, you need to count yourself saved. There's not another step that you need to complete. There's not anything you need to add to the prayer that you said when you got saved, if that's what you did. There's not anything that you need to do beyond trusting Christ as your Savior. If you turn to Jesus from your sin and trusted Him as your Savior, you are saved. Not halfway, not hope so, but we need to get to the place where we know so and we're ready to share our testimony, our story with anybody that will sit still long enough to listen. Verse number 12. Believers, we need to take account of where our loyalty and obedience lies. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Believer, scriptural baptism and church membership should be the first major act of obedience after you get saved. You need to be a baptized, functional member of the local church. Do you, are you, let me say it like this, are you reckoned a member of the Lord's church? Then verse number 13, church, we need to take account of who is getting the advantage from our lives. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, 
But yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members instruments of righteousness unto God. Who is getting the advantage from our lives? Is it, the, is it God or is it the devil? Are we pointing people to Christ or are we leading them away from God? Do you remember what you were saying to the world when you got baptized? That you had been buried with Christ and that you had been raised a new creation in Christ Jesus? That's what you were saying when you got baptized. Does our lives in our everyday lives, is that agreeing with what we said when we got baptized? Some reckoning that needs to be done. Some here this morning are not saved. Never trusted Christ as your Savior. Friend, I would advise you to reckon where you'll spend eternity. I would advise you if you lost this morning to reckon exactly how and where your sin will be judged because the Bible the God of heaven says in His Word that your sins were either judged at, at Calvary where Jesus died and paid for your sin or they will be judged at the great white throne, at the throne of God. And listen, friend, if you find yourself being judged at the, at the great white throne of God, it's too late to get saved. You've already stepped off into eternity by then. Are you saved this morning? Amen. There's some here today that are saved, but you're not, verse 4, walking in newness of life. That's a good King James word, walking. You may have been, spiritually speaking, you may have been saved and raised to newness of life. You may definitely be a new creation in Christ Jesus, but that don't mean you're walking like it. You can be saved and not act like it. You need to reckon your walk with the Lord this morning, believer. You need to reckon what kind of an effect your life is having on others. What kind of an effect is it having on lost people? Are you saved this morning? How's your walk with the Lord? Do you have something that you need to get right with God? Today. We're going to stand and sing a verse of invitation. 326. Hymn number 326. <coughs> Hymn 